I'm Steve Weinstein, Altair's chairman, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Martin Eichenbaum. Now, every year in preparing for this program, uh, Anna Nichols, Jason Laurie, David Lynn, we all get together and we say, well, how can we find a, a keynote speaker who has the expertise, areas of focus and perspective given our current economic situation? So we look for someone who's an excellent presenter and can translate economic data in a manner that can be both meaningful and useful. And it's a tough combination, so you think, well, let's get a college economics professor. That sounds like a good idea. And Martin Eichenbaum has both of those qualities. So Dr. Eichenbaum is the Charles Moscos Professor of Economics and co-director of the Center for International Economics at Northwestern, where he has taught since 1988. His research focuses on macroeconomics, international economics, and monetary theory and policy. Now, during his career, he's also taught at Carnegie Mellon, uh, that other great university down in Hyde Park, and the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, in addition, he's been a consultant to Federal Reserve Banks of Chicago, Atlanta, and San Francisco, as well as the International Monetary Fund. Now, in your little uh, icon there that you can put your phone on, you can see all of his accolades. But uh, the one I thought was very interesting was that he's a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. That's the body that determines exactly when we're in and out of a recession, among other things. And currently, Marty serves as the co-editor of the NBER Macro Annual. Uh, he received his Bachelor in Economics from McGill University uh, in uh, Canada in 1976 and a PhD in Economics from the University of Minnesota in 1981. Please help me welcome Professor Martin Eichenbaum. Thank you very much uh, for that gracious uh, introduction. Um, I have learned over time that um, being an economist, you're sort of a negative beta asset. People, you're counter cyclical. People want you to speak when times are bad. So 2008 was a great year for speaking. 2020 was great. And this is a great year for speaking. Um, not sure that's good news for anybody else. But anyways, so what I thought I would talk about today uh, was background. How did we get into the situation that we're in now? So that's the COVID recession and the recovery. Uh, then I want to talk about what's causing inflation because that's really central uh, to thinking about how the heck we're going to get out of this situation. I want to talk about the Fed's bet on a soft landing. So to be clear, what I mean by a soft landing is uh, what other people have talked about. Well, there's going to be a recession, but it's not going to be too bad. So that's just a nice way of saying it won't be too bad. And I will be a little bit skeptical or talk about some things that could go wrong in this soft landing scenario. And then I want to end with flashpoints, uh, by which I just mean things that uh, keep me up at night uh, that are not necessarily very high probability, but should make you a little bit nervous too. Okay, so we can think about the initial impact of the pandemic uh, world real GDP growth in 2020 was, you know, a catastrophe, minus 3.6%. And you can see red means worse, green means good. So we're ESG friendly here. And uh, it was really bad in most of the world. China initially uh, was, uh, you know, doing relatively well. And one thing, if you've studied COVID, which, which I've, I've tried to work on, is no one country did it perfectly and at different stages of COVID, different systems had different advantages and disadvantages. So we may have screwed up a little bit then, China is kind of screwing up a little bit now, uh, so take your turn. Now, the percent change in real GDP for the US was, I, I emphasize, unprecedented. As, there's just nothing in the books like it, right? Certainly for the post-war, uh, decline and subsequent recovery. So you see these absolutely wild declines, very rapid, 
and, and a, a pretty quick rebound, uh, not so coincidentally associated with vaccines. Now, at the same time that the impact of COVID was unprecedented, the US policy response was also unprecedented. Um, maybe we were fighting the last war, namely 2008. Uh, it's easy to think after the fact and say, oh, gee, they did too much, but try and put yourself in their, your head in March of 2020. Um, so the stimulus bill approved by Congress beginning in 2020 really released the largest amount of federal money into the U.S. economy in recorded history. There's nothing like it. So we're talking about $5 trillion, right, just on the fiscal side. And it went to, you know, households, mom and pop shops, restaurants, airlines, uh, government schools, other institutions. You know, one of the reasons that the uh, states and munis got through all of this, right, was that the government was really helping when tax revenues were really falling, right? Well, that's partly because of, of Washington's response. Um, more germane, perhaps, for today, there was literally massive Fed intervention to support the economy and financial markets. So just a quick summary of things that you know, the federal funds rate went down to zero. Right? We'll come back to that federal funds rate, but it was just down at zero. Uh, there was quantitative easing. What's that? Just massive purchases of debt securities by the Fed, primarily treasury, mortgage-backed securities in an effort to support those markets. There was lending to securities firms, namely low interest rate loans, to the primary dealers. Uh, they backstopped money market mutual funds, that is say they lent to banks against collateral uh, that they purchased from prime money market mutual funds. Repo operations, which are huge, the Fed vastly expanded the scope of its repurchase operations, basically to funnel cash into, uh, into uh, money markets. There was direct lending to major corporate employers, buying new bonds, providing loans. The Fed purchased existing corporate bonds. Um, the Fed bought commercial paper, essentially lending money directly to corporations for up to three months. They made loans to small and mid-sized business. And they supported households, consumers, small businesses. I mean, you name it, they did it that you know, student loans, auto loans, credit card loans, loans guaranteed by the Small Business Administration, on and on and on. So this is not exactly a Milton Friedman paradise, for good or for bad. You just had massive intervention. Now, what happened to the size of the Fed's balance sheet? And this is uh, really quite a startling uh, slide when you see it. So in 2008, we started the old world, the Ancien Regime, at an $800 billion uh, Fed balance sheet, the assets that they had. And then after the financial crisis, you're at about $2 trillion, and then you get to here, we're at $4 trillion, and then it zooms up to $9 trillion. That's the stuff that the Fed owns, okay? And you might say, how would you pay for something like that? Congress didn't pass any bills, right? We didn't vote in any referendum. Well, it turns out this is the magic of the Fed, is they printed money, essentially, and created bank reserves. Whoever's the chairman, person, or woman, or man, just hits a tab button, and all of a sudden, I got enough money to pay for that stuff. That's just how it happens. And so uh, if you look here at the monetary base, but we could look at many, many different aggregates, what's the monetary base? It's just current, uh, currency in, in circulation and commercial bank deposits held in the central bank reserves, well, that just went up from, um, it went from, you know, 3 trillion to a peak of over 5 trillion. That's one example of how the Fed just hit the tab button, the enter button, and all of a sudden, everybody. you can't fight the Fed on that dimension. They can hit that button as many times as they want. Okay, so that's the Fed on the one hand. So they're pumping a lot of money into the economy. What about the government deficit? So this is Washington now, as opposed to you know, the Treasury. Well, the primary deficit, that's just excluding interest payments of the federal government, uh, exploded to 15% of GDP in 2020 and 12.4% in 2021. How does the government finance those deficits? 
Well, the Fed bought most of the Treasury securities. So basically, the Fed's printing money through the intermediary of a thing called the Treasury security in order for the government to run its operation in this emergency situation. Okay? So the Fed is printing money in order to send out all these checks and all the forms of help that was being provided to the country. And this is a very dramatic graph. Um, it's a little bit crowded. But what I have up here is the, um, the, the primary deficit and net interest rate outlay. So you can see here this unprecedented deficit. So it's about 15% of GDP. There is one other time when it was even bigger, and that was World War II. Right? When we were fighting the bad guys, we did it by uh, burdening future generations because they were also going to benefit from the victory. By the way, do you know how we paid this off eventually? Well, let's look at the debt. Here was the national debt as a percent of GDP. Here's where we are now. So it's pretty close to what it was at the end of World War II. What's this insane thing? Well, that's the Congressional Budget Office's estimate of what will be the national debt if we don't do anything different. There is no way in heck that we're ever going to get to that number because it will be the end of the world before that. So this is just saying something has to change. And we could spend a lot of time talking about what that is. That's not really the key point today. How did we get out of World War II? Well, a combination of tax increases and a bunch of inflation. We inflated a, the real value, a lot of that debt away. Okay? So that's just important uh, from the perspective of history to remember that. So where are we now? And this recaps a little bit of uh, the previous comments. Well, this is employment. It's pretty dramatic if you look at it, right? So you can see this is going back to, you know, here's the financial crisis. Here's employment. You get this huge drop, but we're now actually above pre-pandemic employment levels uh, moderately. Okay, so that's good. Um, here's net worth and disposable income. And this is a pretty crowded graph, but just let me, it, it cuts to the point of whether we're going to have, you know, financial crisis or anything like that. What you want to see here is the red is real disposable income. What are these big spikes? Well, that's the government sending checks out, right? That's stuff arriving via the mail. That's disposable income. So you can see these big peaks and then the checks stop coming and you sort of come back to kind of where we were before the pandemic. Uh, and here's net worth, and that's very relevant for this crowd. Uh, net worth, of course, went down, but it's now up. You know, there's a slight downward tick because of the horrible nature of equity markets and bond markets, but it's important to keep that in perspective that the net worth of um, households and nonprofit organizations is still very, very high by, by any standard. And this is also very important. And, you know, when, when you work for a bank or you work for the Fed, one of the things that you look at is there's this thing called a stock of excess household savings. Households have saved much more over the past couple of years uh, than you would have anticipated. Right? So they're sitting on a lot of savings. Part of that was people got their checks. There wasn't much to spend them on during the pandemic. And they sat on them. They were slipped out and worried, and they sat on them. What's true is uh, that excess saving is primary. The less the affluent people, that excess saving has gone away. Okay? So it's basically people, uh, relatively affluent people. The other thing is household debt service payments as a percentage of disposable personal income is act, it's gone up but it's still very low by any historical standards. And so that's really important in thinking about, say, comparing this to previous crises. Will we see a crisis? No. The balance sheets, certainly of households, the balance sheets of uh, certainly rich households are in pretty good shape, okay? And so, so that's important as background in thinking about how big a recession could we be facing. And here's something you've already seen, uh, and that is uh, what is happening to uh, household spending, real consumption expenditures. You've got services, total goods, durables. You know, we had 
a, 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 a big increase in durable goods expenditures, right, that went up, and now it's coming back down. Services are going up, but that's, you know, that is partly going to come back to the issue of inflation. But all in all, it's a picture of an economy recovering of people in pretty good shape, but labor markets are very, very tight. So what's this graph? This is something that the Fed looks at very carefully. The unemployment rate is the blue, and you can see that's a very tight labor market by, by, by any stretch of the imagination. You can also see unfilled job vacancies, and that's the red, and that's all of you when you work in your business and you say, look, we have great jobs, we can't fill them, right? That, that's you over there, you know, tearing your hair out when you're trying to fill out those, those jobs. But notice, it's a slight downtick, right? So the economy is starting to cool off, but remember, it's from extraordinary tight levels. Now, this is really important. Uh, as you all know that there's upward pressure on wages, right? So here I have uh, wages and salaries and benefits of civilian workers, 12 month percent change. You've got wages and salaries and benefits, and what you want to see here is they've gone up. All of you know that, right? You're paying a lot in wages and you're not happy about it. And it's basically going up by, you know, depending on how you count, five or 6%, and that's a problem. But it's actually worse than that. If you look at employment costs, taking into account productivity of workers, productivity has actually fallen in the last year or so. And what that means is your employment cost is actually going up even more. So let's, let's just remember that. Your employment cost, you're facing a lot of pressure on employment costs on average. Now, here's the killer. So you guys are getting hurt because productivity is down and wages are up. But what about the people who work for you? Well, here I've got employed full-time or non-farm business sector, doesn't really matter much. What's happening to real wages by which I mean wages minus inflation, the things that people really care about, right? In the end, you don't buy stuff with nominal money, right? You all know the price of goods is way up. And that means that workers on average are making less money. So they're making less money, but you're paying a lot more money. Okay, that, that wedge being productivity. That's very important to remember that the the reason wage, the nominal wages are going up, but real wages are going down. And that's why people, uh, real people are unhappy. So what's the, uh, what's the skunk in the party? Well, the skunk in the party is inflation, as, as, as people have told you. And there's different measures of inflation. So for example, what I've got here is just the regular CPI, which we've already discussed. That's way up, and you can notice, you go back to 19... Uh, 88, you know, it's obviously very, very high. Personal consumption expenditures, that's something that the Fed looks at, okay? So that excludes a variety of things. It just looks at what you're doing, and that's very high. And then you exclude food and energy, and that's also a bit lower. But by any stretch of the imagination, inflation is unacceptably high. From the Fed's perspective, their target is roughly 2%. They don't expect to achieve that on a month by month or quarter by quarter basis. But you don't want to be the Fed guy that got what went down the way Paul Volcker's predecessor is viewed by history. Okay, that's not, you don't want that on your job resume. Okay, this can't go on both for the Fed's perspective, from the public's perspective, uh, from real wage perspective. We just can't let that go on. Okay, so what's driving inflation, right? It's a million dollar question. So I have a little bit of a um, two person uh, thing here. At the beginning, we had team transitory. And these guys were arguing, they emphasized transitory supply side issues, which you all know about. And they said, well, you know, it's this and it's that and it's this and it's that, all the stuff coming out of COVID, you know, uh, shipping costs, et cetera, computer disks, et cetera. So, you know, that's identified with Paul Krugman. And so they were telling the Fed, don't do anything. It's all going to be better. Just relax. And they were wrong. Team transitory was persistently wrong. Okay. Team persistent, who identified with Larry Summers, he emphasized the demand 
pressures on the economy coming from fiscal and monetary policy, as I've just argued, was extremely accommodative um, during the peak COVID episodes. Okay, it's not a criticism to say that they were accommodative during the crisis. You know, it's the fog of war, right? We had to do something. But the Fed was behind the curve in raising interest rates, according to Larry Summers, and I personally agree with that. Certainly in 2021, if you go back by the mid-year, we might have known that inflation uh, was, was starting to go up a lot. What's the nightmare scenario that everybody worries about? It's a wage price spiral. Once people start to think that inflation is really persistent, that's when your labor folks come to you and go, look, my real wages are falling. This can't go on. 5% is not enough. 6% is not enough. At least keep me even with inflation. Well, then what do you guys do to the extent that you agree to that? Then you have to bake up, you have to raise your prices, and we get this self-fulfilling spiral that gets extraordinarily hard and costly from a social perspective to stop. And then that is exactly what happened in the 70s until Paul Volcker came in and we had an extraordinarily painful recession, which none of us wants to go through again. So you got to nip this thing in the bud is the conventional wisdom before those ex expectations start to uh, uh, become self-fulfilling. So there's a big debate here now about, well, how much is it demand and how much is it supply? There's a really cool study in the San Francisco Fed um, where they basically looked at every product in the, in the CPI and said, well, gee, if prices and quantities are moving in the same direction, there must be demand. And if prices are going up and quantities going down, it must be supply. So let's count every single good that we can get our hands on and that way decompose things into demand and supply. And you know, this is for headline PCE inflation. This is for core PCE inflation that takes out the, uh, the energy and food. And what you can see here is in the beginning, team transitory was not crazy. There were a lot of supply side shocks. So the, the orange is relatively important compared to the blue. As we move through time, notice over here, the blue is getting more and more and more important. So it's becoming a demand side driven phenomenon, which is a very difficult thing to stop. It's not going to go away by itself. This is what you worry about that becomes a wage price spiral. So, um, as was mentioned, inflation did peak, um, or it appeared to peak. Let's see what happens next month. Um, you know, but uh, in November 10, uh, the Labor Department said the CPI, you know, had gone up by 7.7% on a 12 month basis. And, you know, compare that to June 9.1%. So that's good, right? That's a little bit of progress. Core CPI, a similar story. But in any event, remember, an improvement does not mean uh, that you're where you need to be. Moreover, uh, the market last Thursday, I'm sure everybody was very in a very good mood, went crazy, okay? But if you look at bond yields, bond yields, right, interest rates actually went down, which is exactly the opposite of what the Fed wants, right? So it's really critical for the Fed to, right, how are they gonna slow down the economy? They're raising rates. You guys, if you see the slightest bit of, not you guys, but if the market overreacts and interest rates go down in the long end, that makes their job that much harder and that makes it less likely that they're actually going to ease, right? So again, we don't know what's going to happen. Now, the Fed, as, as you know, proof of, uh, of concept, the Fed is committed to fighting inflation. This is important. They're tapering. That would say they're not renewing their purchases of securities or treasuries, which is an important uh, uh, effect in the bond market. And they will, they've also said, we're going to sell mortgage-backed securities if they don't run off fast enough. It's a little bit hard to predict those MBSs because of refinancing rates, things like that. And they said, look, we will sell things off outright rather than let them just run out. You all know that we're raising the federal funds rate and the magical question is how high should they and how high will they? So I have to be a little bit technical uh, just for just one moment to make a crucial distinction. Most of us think about the nominal interest rate. What's the nominal interest rate? That's I, I mean, you can ignore the notation if it bothers you. 
It's just your normal interest rate that you get on a bond. But what's the real interest rate? Well, the real interest rate is the nominal interest rate minus inflation. It could be expected inflation or it could be actual inflation. What does the Fed think affects real economic activity and ultimately inflation? It's not the nominal interest rate, it's the real interest rate. If you're, quote, rational, your cost of capital is after you take inflation into account. So the Fed has to get the real to a number that slows things down enough. Now, so they've got to work really hard to raise that expected real interest rate. But let me put some, what are these crazy dots? These are the famous Fed dot plots where they, um, uh, each regional president says, this is what I think interest rates are gonna be at each point in time going out into the future. So every dot there is a person. It could be Charlie Evans at the Chicago Fed, it could be Jim Bullard at St. Louis, Laura Bester, anyway, so each of those are his dots. And what you wanna see is, typically you see medians, that where they might give you averages, but notice there's a bunch of disagreement. The medians are going up, but there's some people there who think, you know, over, they, they really think it's gonna be pretty high. But on average, they think it's gonna peak around 5% now. That's gone up a lot over time. If I showed you the dot plots three or four years ago, they really got it wrong. It wasn't just the private sector that got it wrong, it was the Fed also got it wrong. Um, but they think they're gonna peak at about five percentage points. This is, um, and they think we're gonna have a soft landing. So what's this? This is from the September Federal Open Market Committee this is their projections of what um, uh, real GDP is going to be and the unemployment rate. That's the stuff over here. And you see there's some standard deviation there. So just look at the central measure. But it looks like they think, you know, real GDP is going to decline, but it's going to be, quote, a soft landing. Maybe it'll be plus 1% or minus 1%, but it's not going to be anything like 2008. And the unemployment rate they think will peak at most uh, hardly any big increase, maybe at four and a half, which hardly seems like a lot. And it's the kind of, it's some average of what the unemployment rate has been in the past. That's what I mean by a soft landing. So let's do some number experiments because I want to set up a race. Suppose the short-term interest rate rose to 5%. That's what they're predicting, right? And say inflation actually stayed at 7%, then the real interest rate would still be negative. They'd be paying you, right, to take out loans. That's a good deal, right? So the cost of capital is negative. That's hardly a prescription for a slowdown. Uh, but the question is, as they raise those rates, inflation is going to be coming down. So maybe I shouldn't keep inflation at 7% in my head when I do that experiment. Um, we're going to see that there's this race. So there's a bunch of market participants who actually think that the federal funds rate will exceed 6%. It's not the average, but there's a bunch of people who think that. Um, and if inflation then fell to 4%, okay, then we'd have a real rate of 2%. And that seems like kind of a rate that would slow things down. Now, why is this so dark? Now, let me just say, if you actually look at uncertainty of market participants, let, let's just get to that. So we have a race. I'll come back to that. It's a race. The race is the Fed's raising rates, inflation's coming down. The Fed knows exactly how quickly it can raise rates. It doesn't kind of know how fast inflation's coming down. So we're all betting on the race. Right? So the Fed is looking real time to see if there's a persistent decline in inflation, how fast it is. So we have a data dependent rise in rates. Maybe it'll go down 50 basis points and they'll see what's going on with inflation. Maybe that will result in enough that they stop at five and maybe it won't and they'll go to six. Um, do the, does the market think the Fed will succeed in lowering the inflation rate? Yeah, absolutely. If you look at standard measures, financial markets seem quite optimistic. 
if you just look at real interest rates, say from tips or something, uh, and longer term inflation seems to be anchored. I will say this, that if you look at households, it's a, a very different picture. So, so this is inflation um, expectations backed out from financial markets, and you can see they're pretty reasonable. They've come down from what they were over here, but they came down because the Fed was raising rates. So financial markets said, yeah, we kind of believe you. If at the same time you had looked at households, which I'm not going to have here, uh, they're less optimistic. So if you look at them going out a year, they think it's going to be 5%. But if you, even the households think that over the long run, we're going to be about 2% or something like that. So the Fed has not lost credibility by that measure. Not to make this a seminar, but a lot of times we look at the average level. We don't look at how much people disagree with each other. And skewness is one statistical measure. There's a big fat right tail. That means there's a bunch of people who think that things are going to get out of hand. Okay, that's all you need to know about skewness, right? You can have two distributions of the same mean, but very different skewness. And um, that turns out to be a really interesting uh, phenomenon. Um, skewness amongst households has started to rise a lot. That is, if you look at the Michigan survey of inflation expectations, starting in the mid half of 2021, skewness started rising. As skewness started rising, um, standard deviation goes up, right? the volatility goes up, or variance goes up. And eventually, Everything shifts so much to the right that the average that we tend to look at also goes up. So there are people like Ricardo Reich who say, well, if you want a better measure of what's going to happen, look at skewness now because that tells you what's going to happen to means in the future. So you look for a lot of disagreement now. If you see a lot of disagreement growing, that tells you that in the future, the average is going to go up. And interestingly, that's exactly what happened in... Um, uh, that, that's exactly what happened uh, in um, th that happened in previous uh, episodes like Volcker and before. This pattern of skewness going up, then translating to the median. Now the Fed knows this. The Fed knows this, so they're looking at that skewness, right? And they're saying we have to be concerned about this. We can't let that wage price spiral cost. We think five percent is what we have to do. But trust me, they know they may have to go higher. And we should know that too. Doesn't mean they will. Doesn't mean they will, but they might. Okay. So forecasts, they've been coming down. As you all know, every week we pick up the paper and it seems like forecasts are coming down. Uh, the IMF just a couple days ago now projects, uh, sorry, the IMF projects the US real GDP growth to be 1.6 and 1% respectively in 2022 and 23. So they're not saying you're going to quote have a recession, but they're saying you're going to have very slow growth. And that's consistent with, you know, as I understand the, uh, 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 the view here and, and my own view that it'll be, you know, soft. If, if any recession, it'll be soft. Um, but that is a pretty pessimistic view, that increasing pessimism. If you look at the National Association of Business Economists, more than 50% of, of the panelists think that there's a more than even likelihood that we're going to enter into a recession in the next year. Okay. And on November the 13th, the IMF cut its global growth forecast to 2.7% from a previous forecast to 2.9%. Where they think things are particularly weak, Europe is a basket case, China is slowing down, that's going to drag everything down and to some extent affect the United States as well. But that's, you know, that, that, that is not by any means uh, the financial crisis. So if we look here, this is the probability that the U.S. is in a recession in the next 12 months. This is from the Wall Street Journal uh, survey of economists, and you can see that that's gone up substantially and is now about 60%. Another way to see that things have been, people are getting more and more pessimistic, here's GDP expectations. These are forecasts of economists, April 22, June 22, July 22, August, you know, and you see things are going down, down, down. But again, to remind you, this is very low growth. It is not the financial crisis. 
Okay. Let me end with just one or two flashpoints and, and then take questions. Liquidity is, you know, for real market participants know it's a very big deal. And one of the big problems that we've seen in the last couple of years is the treasury market of all things is less showing, is less liquid than it used to be. Part of the problem there um, is that, and I won't take you through the weeds here, but if you are at a bank because of regulations, it is much more difficult to be a market maker to hold those kind of assets on your balance sheet. It, it hurts your capital ratios. So banks don't want to do it or they're less willing to do it. That means the market is kind of thin, right? And sometimes for reasons that we don't entirely understand, there's enormous amount of volatility in, in, in those yields. Now, here's just you know an example of where we are with liquidity bid ask spreads have widened significantly over time market depth has declined sharply and liquidity premiums have gone up in a variety of markets but also treasury uh in treasuries so that's something we worry about what could cause all of this to really be an enormous problem so again this is in the category of things that could happen that should frighten you but they're not my point estimate. The debt limit, this is, upon, this is coming upon us. The federal debt ceiling was raised in December of 2021 to 31.38 trillion. Now, the debt limit is a really weird thing. Congress votes on taxes, it votes on spending, so it knows what the deficit's gonna be. The debt limit is another calculation that says, well, you said one and one is going to be two, but we're only going to let you go to 1.5. It's this artificial limit on uh, the total debt that we can have, even after they've decided to, uh, to, to do their spending and their taxes. So what if Congress doesn't agree to increase the debt limit? Today, the Wall Street Journal reported that uh, the Biden people had hoped to uh, get a lame duck increase in the debt limit before the new Congress, and they've now abandoned that, that effort. It's just not going to happen. So it's going to be the new Congress that decides on whether we raise the debt limit. What was the last time we had a debt limit crisis? It was around roughly 2011 when the economy was going along pretty nicely. And then we had that debt limit crisis, if you recall, and that put everything slow. It was, it was a problem. Right? We had a big slowdown in, in, in growth because of that. Even the threat of a default on treasuries, because at some point you can't pay because you're not allowed to. So then you can't pay treasuries. If that even was a threat to happen, that means yields would go crazy. But that means, you know, and of course, treasuries are the one safe asset, we think. They're the foundation of the financial system. If that was no longer true, all hell breaks loose. Now, no one has any idea what would really happen in that event, but Moody said, well, this would be kind of like the Great Recession, like the financial crisis. But again, I'm not saying that's going to happen. It's in the category of what's the tail event that I see that could really make me wrong, could make economists wrong, could make, you know, our point forecast here that we're talking about. That's the one thing, I mean, nuclear war, you know, of course, but, but this is a financial thing that is not that crazy. It's not out of the realm of imagination that we would get to the point where we were in 2011, where we didn't actually default, but markets moved a lot because we thought that it was a possibility. So now that I've ruined your lunch, um, I think that the Fed thinks we're, we're heading for a soft landing with nominal interest rates peaking under 5%. My own personal view is that rates will probably go higher five and a half, you know, something like that, maybe six. Um, and that means growth will be a little less, a little more anemic than your baseline forecast, but by no means is, is that the, uh, a crisis. Um, and the one thing that could go really wrong for political reasons, not for economic reasons, right? This is a political scenario and you might agree, you might disagree that they should or wouldn't, I don't wanna be political, but if that happens, that will be a, a really major tail event that will be very harmful to all of us. So I'll stop with that.
Okay, we're going to turn to the Q&A portion. And of course, Marty, my first question has to be a, a follow-up. I'll just point out that uh, the last time we almost came to default, uh, it was because of the Republicans in Congress. Uh, and I, we, we all know, and, and as you know, Altair uh, is uh, independent. We don't take sides. We just like to point things out. Um, how did that work out for the Republicans in the subsequent election? It didn't work out too well. So that at least I think uh, gives us a bit of comfort that, uh, you know, whatever grandstanding may happen, because I, I, I do think that uh, cooler heads do recognize this danger, but uh, I, I think it's important to, to point that out. So my first question is, uh, and maybe we'll exclude this crisis. Um, it's clear from your comments that you believe that a recession is a foregone conclusion. Uh, we think it's probably gonna be more mild. You think it, it may be a, a, not a little, a little bit more than mild, but I guess my question is, do you see any systemic risks other than this liquidity one similar to what happened in the great financial crisis? Well, no, and the answer is no, and that's the good news. Um, I think the banks are very well regulated. Um, I, I know that their capital position is very good. Um, housing, you know, we don't have a lot of leverage stuff like housing. So I don't think it's 2008. The, I, that's certainly not my point estimate. House, uh, uh, we know household debt structure is very good. Uh, worry sometimes about, you know, when you regulate the banks, capital moves away from the banks to less regulated areas. So you never say never because of the shadow banks. Uh, but there's nothing that I've seen that tells me that the shadow banks are systemically a problem. Uh, although I do think as we move to high interest rates, some business models that made sense when cost of capital was very low, no longer makes sense, but that's not necessarily a systemic crisis. Glad to hear that. Uh, <laughs> Let's switch and let's talk about the U.S. dollar. Um, we've really seen an unprecedented rise in the dollar over the years. It certainly impacted uh, multinational companies. It's hurt returns on foreign equities. Uh, lately, it's weakened a bit. Uh, what do you expect the dollar's path to be going forward? So, um, when it comes to forecast exchange rates, First and foremost, I have no clue. Um, so if you ask, can you beat a random walk when it comes to forecasting exchange rates up to horizons of a year? The answer is no. Nobody can do it. If I hope we're not trying to do it. Uh, it, just, it can't be done, okay? I mean, maybe somebody will figure it out, but no. So if you ask me, what do I think the dollar will be in five months from now, it's whatever it is now. It is also true that over longer horizons, we do have ways to predict the exchange rate. And you know, over horizons of five to 10 years, I think you'll see a depreciation of the dollar, but that's not something you can bet on uh, in terms of a short-term bet. So what's extraordinary to me is that uh, at least what we all learned uh, in uh, school and in uh, you know, postgraduate work was that over time, the differential evens out in exchange rates. And certainly that has not been the case in, in the last five or 10 years. Look, the carry trade is, this, you know, uh, so Sergio Rebello, who's spoken here in the past, we wrote 10 years ago, extraordinary profitability of the carry trade, which is basically borrow interest rates in a country where they're high and sell them, you know, and, and uh, borrow in, in places where interest rates are low and invest them in where interest rates are high. That's a winning strategy on average because exchange rates don't do what they're supposed to in the text, like in the textbooks, because if you expect exchange rates to be the same, that means you expect your return on investing in high interest rate uh, yields to be a good investment, right? Now, things, it, now that carry trade is at the core of a lot of company strategies, say at Goldman or at uh, big banks, et cetera. They make a lot of money on the carry trade. They haven't made a lot of money on the carry trade recently because interest rates were all so low, there was no differential to exploit. Now that interest rates are rising again, 
and not at the same rate, the carry trades back in fashion. Let, let's stay on the international theme. Um, how concerned should we be about the economic outlook outside the United States, specifically in Europe, uh, slowing growth in China? So, the, you know, um, basically, I agree with the IMF that even leaving aside tail events, you know, the UK is in terrible shape, Germany is in terrible shape, there's just not going to be much growth in Europe uh, over the next year. And so if you're exposed to Europe, you're just, you know, it's not going to work out well. China is more difficult to predict, but they've certainly seen a slowdown. And they actually do have some systemic risk um, with their real estate sector, etc. But, you know, China is different. They don't have to do things by interest rates, right? They could just send in the army and say, guess what? It's good. My way or the highway. So they have something even more powerful than the Fed, uh, but it doesn't mean it's going to end well. Let me ask uh, Anna, do we have any questions from the audience? Not yet. Wow, that's surprising. How about our in-house uh, questions? Do we have, we'll get you a, uh, a microphone over here and then we'll come to the back next. And it's, uh, Sam's coming over with a microphone. Based on the scenario that you think is most likely right now, where do you see unemployment going in that scenario? Unemployment? Yeah, repeat the, repeat the Oh, uh, where do I see uh, in my base scenario, unemployment is going to? Um, you know, I think the Fed thinks it's gonna peak at about four and a half. Um, if I'm a little more pessimistic, uh, maybe five, but even that is, you know, hardly a catastrophe. A party, you have to be a little bit careful. I have to be a little bit careful. That's premised on assumptions about labor force participation rates. And uh, if more people enter the labor force than we anticipated, the unemployment will be a little higher. If less people enter the labor force, because literally the unemployment rate is uh, the number of people actively looking for a job who can't get a job. So if you have more people looking for a job, that's, that you know, is gonna be an issue. Anyways, but I would say four and a half, five, hardly a catastrophe. And when I was going to school, 4% uh, was considered full employment. Yeah, I mean, and, and that sometimes that's controversial, but we expect there to be a normal churn, right? As people look for jobs, leave jobs, people leave the uh, labor force for life reasons, you know, having kids, et cetera. So we expect 4% to be sort of an average that's neither inflationary nor deflationary. Um, and that's consistent. If you think the Fed thinks it's going to be four and a half, uh, and they don't know exactly, but they think that's roughly consistent with getting back to target um, and getting back to quote normal times. And again, we're at 3.7%. We're at 3.7. So that says you're going to have a recession, but uh, not anything like the great, like the financial crisis. In the back. How long do you think it'll take before that we'll see some real direction in rates where it'll become much clearer of where we're going to be? Well, I can, let me channel. Oh, uh, how long do I think it will be before we see clear direction on these rates? Look, I think the Fed is trying very hard to convey that rates are gonna to continue to go up. So we were at 75 basis points going up, um, assuming last Thursday they didn't change their minds, they may punish us, uh, but assuming they're not gonna punish us, you know, I think they're gonna do 50 and they're gonna look because they don't have a crystal ball. So I think it's, it's really much like this race uh, analogy I was trying to give you, where they're seeing the outcome of the race while they're in the middle of the race, and they'll decide whether to go faster or longer, depending on how inflation responds. So, you know, I think we're talking about a year long episode, roughly speaking. Um, I, I should say that when we back out uncertainty of market participants of where they think interest rates are from options, it's very high. It's a little lower than it was at the peak about a year ago, but if you compare by, if you look at options data and back out what uncertainty is in the, in the mind of people betting on, on treasury futures, that uncertainty is at a very high level. So like you and like me, most market participants, they have their mean expectations, which is what we focus on, 
there's a bunch of disagreement there. Question, or, or I think one more in the back and then we'll come up front here. Mine, was, my, uh, mine is, so if the wisdom was 4.6 and then now it's moved to five based on things that happened, you're suggesting five and a half, perhaps six. What, how, what would your estimate be on how long they have to sustain it at that level before they would start to reduce? Well, again, that's an issue of the response. Of, uh, how long would they have to keep it at five and a half or six uh, before inflation starts coming down? I don't think very long. I mean, six is, you know, if, if inflation at that point is, say, four, then the real rate would be two. That's a pretty reasonable cost of capital by historical standards. Um, you know, so maybe they might stay there a quarter of a year, something like that. But I could be wrong. You know, it could be wrong. It could be a half year. So one of the things to focus on, and we've talked about this a lot in our investment committee discussions with Jason and David. Um, I understand we're sitting here, and for many of you uh, who are young of the younger generations, you haven't yet experienced these types of markets, you haven't seen inflation. Uh, Marty and I and several other members probably of our uh, studio audience and the, the audience at home uh, remember the 70s. Uh, we remember gas lines. Uh, by the way, there was a war in the 70s too. Uh, there were certainly uh, all kinds of, of uh, geographic uh, un unsettling things. Uh, the Fed in the 80s under Paul Volcker did have to raise rates to 20%. Now, the Dow Jones was at 1,000 in the early 80s. And what happened with the right combination of monetary and fiscal policy is we saw one of the greatest bull markets in history from 1982 all the way to March of 2000. So I think, and again, we're not saying that it's not going to be a volatile time for the next three, six, nine, 12 months, but where we're going to come out is with normalized real interest rates. So if inflation gets down to three or two, and by the way, we lived with 3% inflation a long time, mm -hmm. uh, we can sustain growth, we can sustain uh, a healthy stock market. And by the way, the uh, this is kind of ironic, but the expected return now is based on real interest rates. So guess what? The long-term return for stocks is 10%. But that's when inflation might have been three or four percent, and we have a factor for risk. So actually, expected returns are going up. Same thing with uh, what Cara said about bond yields. Gee, we actually have real interest rate uh, returns now going forward. So I think the medium to long term opportunities, you have to be a bit optimistic. Assuming now I'm going to lead you into my next question, and then I'll get to you, Richard, and that's to fiscal policy. Um, you know, uh, there was a, a lot of talk about uh, uh, from from some folks uh, on on an extreme that we had modern monetary theory. It doesn't matter what Congress Congress can spend whatever they want. Deficits don't matter. Uh, what What do you think about? Uh, Modern monetary theory. Well, uh, okay, so is I'll it just, dead? It, well, it was never alive, <laughs> um, but if you know, it is dead because it should be dead. It's um, you know, whenever somebody tells you that there's free candy and Santa Claus is coming next, you shouldn't believe it, right? And that's what they were basically telling us. Um, you know, you got to pay the bills in the end. It's it's really that simple. You can pay the bills in a lot of ways. You can pay it with inflation. That's a bad way to pay it. You can pay it by defaulting. That's not a very good way. But if you're going to rule those out, then you're going to have to cut taxes or you're going to have to raise, uh, sorry, you're going to have to increase taxes or you're going to have to cut spending. And then the question is, are you doing that intelligently? One of the problems that we have right now that we didn't have time to talk about is if you look at the composition of government spending, break it into things called discretionary and non-discretionary. You can, you know, but it turns out over time, because of the aging of the population and Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, more and more of the budget is going to non-discretionary spending and less and less to discretionary, the things that, you know, we typically say, oh, let's cut this, let's cut, it's getting to be small potatoes. So 
cutting spending on the non-discretionary items, now we're talking about your health bill, or we're talking about your grandparents, uh, things of that nature, and that's much harder to cut. And we've so far managed to uh, avoid that bullet. But if you looked at that CBO, Congressional Budget Office projection, that bill will come due. I'm not, you know, I don't think it's gonna affect us in the next year or two or three, but that's something you know younger people are going to have to grapple with. How do we deal with that? And by the way, the, the loop to the Fed is this. When you have a debt to GDP ratio of say 40%, people in Congress don't care when you raise interest rates. Right? It's not affecting, the debt servicing is not a big deal in terms of their pet projects. Once you get to debt to GDP of 100%, the debt servicing is a really big deal. You raise the interest rates by two, three percent, or T bills, you know, long stuff. That's really affecting the deficit, and that means that the fiscal guys are looking at the monetary guys, and now we have a food fight. Because remember, the Fed is independent, but that could change in a second. So one of the great dangers of having very high debt to GDP ratios are political pressures on the Fed to not do what they're supposed to do. We're not seeing that with this administration, and that's great. Go to Richard. So it, in the examples that we're showing, um, it shows rates go up, um, and inflation is tamed in exchange for a little bit of a recession. Mm -hmm. But can you help us understand what went wrong in the 70s, which was oh. rates went up to yep. try to tame inflation the recession happened but inflation wasn't tamed i mean so-called sure. stagflation and yep. then draw the help us understand why that's not one of your worries sure that, that uh, in the things that could go wrong the the question is um why do we have inflation going up and uh, and a, a terrible recession you know rates were going up recession went down and why is that qualitatively different now? Um, so I, it's actually inter interesting you raise this. I, I interviewed Ben Bernanke, part of some symposium. And we talked about exactly this question. And he said, there were at least two or three things that went wrong in the 70s. One was political. The Fed was not independent. Richard Nixon Paul called uh, Arthur Burns into the office and spanked him and said, this is what you're going to do. No way you're raising rates before I'm going to run for president. Okay, so that's this exact notion of not having an independent Fed, and there seems to be much more commitment by large parts of society to that. The other thing is that ideas matter, according to Ben, and I agree, that uh, Arthur Burns was convinced that, and you hear echoes of this, it's the unions, it's corporations, it's greed, there's nothing we can do. And so let's not do anything. I don't think people believe that right now. The other thing, which is a little bit um, has to do with expectations, it's a little more subtle. People, once people start to embed their expectation, inflations are very high. You really have to kill the economy. So if the Fed has no credibility, you have to teach the market that they're credible. And the Fed had no credibility then. Hopefully, we have more credibility now, that's an idea thing. And that's hopefully why the Fed is moving so aggressively now to make up for lost time. So I would say a combination of politics, ideas and institutions make today different than the 70s. Well, and I, the only thing I would add, uh, you know, again, you had the unprecedented, like it's a quadrupling of energy prices, which brought things through. You had sort of the payback for what was called guns and butter strategies sure. of the late 60s, the Vietnam War, the Great Society. I mean, Medicare came into the law in 1965. Uh, and at that time, the expectation was that the life expectancy was a little more than age 65. You think about that. Uh, so, you know, the costs got out of control. Um, you also then, so part of it was the reckoning but the other side of it was uh, the, the economy was much less nimble uh, and uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, we, we hear a lot of criticism about uh, 
outsourcing and you know just in time inventory and lowest cost provider but uh, we didn't have the flexibility of manufacturing on a global basis so we, we have a much more flexible economy but it does uh, lead me uh, to a question that is I've always wondered and that is how do we actually define a recession because again when I was in school, it was, well, you have two consecutive quarters of negative GDP, and that's a recession. Not so anymore. And what better person to answer that question than a member of the National Bureau of Economic Research? So without being pedantic in a lecture, they, 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 we talk about the three Ds, depth, duration, and diffusion, right? So GDP falls every night when we go to sleep. We don't call that a recession, right? It, there's no duration. Uh, if one sector of the economy gets hit by an idiosyncratic shock, we don't call that a recession because that's a specific sector. It hasn't diffused. And of course, depth, you know, is it a serious decline? And that's where the growth rate under 2%, uh, under zero is typically mentioned, but it's gotta be all three. And please bear in mind, if you wait until the Bureau declares a recession, you're roadkill. What, we're record keepers. We're record keepers. We're umpires. We're not forecasters. That's not in that capacity. That's not what they do. You get to call balls and strikes after the games. After over. the games. That's why it's easy not to make a mistake. <laughs> and are we at our time? Okay. Well, uh, let me just uh, first of all say thank you, My party. We really appreciate it. Uh, Jason and, and uh, uh, David, thank you. And Anna, thanks for putting everything together. Uh, and thanks to all of you in our room and attending virtually. Uh, we really appreciate it. And it is great to see folks uh, in person. But I do notice that we, we are in a different world now where it is very easy to attend remotely. And we're grateful that those of you um, outside Chicago have, have attended today. Uh, we do look forward to this program every year. We hope that you found today's event to be valuable. Um, if you use valet parking, we do have a coupon for you on the way out. Uh, we'll send one to those of you uh, virtually if you want to park sometime for free <laughs> here. Um, and uh, I and Marty and some of our colleagues will stick around. We'll be here if you have additional questions. And we hope you come to future Altair events. So have a great afternoon and best wishes. Happy, healthy Thanksgiving and holidays to everybody. And again, thanks for attending.